All right, can everybody hear me all right? We got uh, sound this time? We got sound in the, in the uh, stream? Yeah. Very good. All right, I guess we're good, good to get started here. Welcome, thank you all for coming out. I, uh, I know uh, your time is valuable and I appreciate you coming to hear what I have to say. Uh, I'm here to talk about uh, implementing PowerSafe Atomic over the air updates as the slide says. Uh, I wanna thank my company Toradex for sending me here because they're covering the tab. Uh, it's my first time in Japan and I'm uh, happy to be here actually uh, seeing people in person. Uh, it's, uh, it's nice to pick things back up after uh, being on lockdown for so long. And I definitely want to thank the uh, organizing committee for putting this together and uh, getting, getting us all out here to, to hopefully learn something. All right, so just real briefly, because I'm uh, kind of obligated to mention it, we do have a booth here. I work for Toradex. We sell hardware. Uh, a lot of this talk is based on some of the architecture that we use in our Horizon uh, operating system and, and platform. Uh, and uh, that's a, a full end-to-end -end system uh, that's intended to be used in a, embedded uh, IoT, industrial controls, that kind of thing. Um, and the, the, the architecture that we use for our over-the-air updates is what this talk is based on. So it's a third-party uh, open source package called OS Tree. And um, just to kind of give you the, the, the background, that's where the, 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 the meat of this topic has come from, is, is our work with the Horizon operating system and using the open source OS tree infrastructure uh, to, uh, to, to develop uh, the, the secure atomic over the air update system that we use in our platform. Real briefly, since uh, everybody seems to, we have to uh, kind of introduce ourselves uh, so you guys know a little bit about me and maybe why you should listen to what I have to say. Uh, I've been in the embedded uh, space uh, and embedded Linux space for, uh, embedded Linux specifically for about 15 years, embedded uh, in general much longer than that. Uh, like I say, I work for Toradex. I'm currently a solutions architect helping customers implement our solution in their design. So we sell, the so we sell them the hardware. We also have the software. Um, and my, my role is to, to figure out what uh, si portions of our system are appropriate for their environment and help them make best use of all the features that are in our system. Briefly, what we're going to talk about today, obviously, is a little bit of background on what OS Tree is and how it's used in the over-the-air update space. Uh, we're going to define what, uh, what it means to be power safe and how OS Tree implements that. And then we'll talk a little bit about the architecture in OS Tree and how specifically it will allow you to get these over-the-air updates in a safe manner. And then I've got a, a short demo, which is really just a, a video that I had to take. The timing on uh, most of these things is pretty tricky. The system will finish and reboot before I can actually demo it live. So I've got some video uh, that can show a few of the components of this system to help, uh, help you understand how it's uh, useful for this environment. So just kind of some background to kind of motivate this. The simple fact is uh, the updates in, in, in uh, software are no good. We all know this. We've all stared at uh, these screens for, for, for many, many hours. And while you might be able to get away with this on your cell phone or your desktop uh, laptop system, it really doesn't scale well when you're talking about an industrial IoT uh, system where you might be deploying hundreds, thousands, or if you're lucky, tens of thousands of devices, right? You need something that is much more robust, much more reproducible, guaranteed to be atomic, um, and that kind of thing. We, we, we do need a better uh, way to handle updates. There's been a lot of talk, a lot of different uh, software packages implementing updates over the last uh, five, six years. It's a, it's a hot topic, certainly, in the industrial and IoT spaces. And the simple fact is we need to, to, we need to, we need to do better. So why do we care about updates? I think we all understand uh, the, the, the basic motivation for, uh, for needing updates in the field. There's patches, not just to the kernel, but really to all software that's on your system, right? We know there's lots of critical vulnerabil vulnerabilities that are d found all the time. We need to add uh, additional drivers. Sometimes we need to add new hardware support. Uh, our, our users might have a USB that they add and they want to add a device driver for a specific uh, device that may have not been tested at uh, the time you produce the system. Uh, custom firmware binaries are constantly getting updated. So for your Wi-Fi chip, there's a, you know, your custom firmware binary that the manufacturer might push an update for. You want to make sure that your end users get access to that. Uh, and just other vendor, uh, vendor updates, think uh, Spectre Meltdown, all those kind of things that uh, resulted in lots of changes. Uh, in, in the, at the firmware level and in the kernel. Uh, and then, obviously, user space stuff, uh, Heartbleed, 
Uh, there's been uh, quite a few uh, documented cases in the last few years that make it all that much more obvious. One thing that a lot of people don't think about when they're thinking about updates, though, is you can actually use updates to deploy new features and therefore generate more revenue. Uh, Tesla has been a good example of this with some of their, uh, some of their add-ons that uh, you can add after the fact. You can buy them when you buy the car, but if you decide you don't want it then and you come back later, they'll sell it to you for even more than it would have cost you to buy it in the first place. And they're happy to do that, and because they've got a, a full-fledged OTA system, they're able to actually deploy that. So it's, it's very um, desirable uh, from a business perspective to be able to deploy these updates because you can make more money. And just in general, all bug fixes, obviously. That's the, 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 the main uh, impetus for adding OTA. The, the, the first step to, uh, to securing a system is to being, a, being able to update it because the simple fact is all software has bugs, and I think, uh, I think we all know that. So what is OS tree? So OS tree is, a, is an infrastructure, that, uh, infrastructure piece of code that we use in Horizon, and it's used in a number of, other, uh, number of other implementations of similar systems. This quote you see on the screen is directly from, uh, from their documentation. Uh, there's a lot of words here. It's both a shared library, suite of command line tools, yada, yada, yada. Uh, but there's a, a few important uh, key points uh, that I want to point, point out. Um, it uses a Git-like model. So if you're familiar with how Git stores uh, the, the, the source control information for your, your source code using a content addressable file store, uh, OS tree does a very similar thing. Um, so each, each file is essentially associated with a name that corresponds to its hash so that if I then try to upload that same exact file again, the system is able to very easily detect that it's the same exact content as another file. It doesn't need to, to deploy that object. It's able to easily locate it by that hash of the file. Um, so, you know, if you're familiar with Git, you, you'll be uh, well on your way to understanding how OS tree uh, does things. Where it differs from Git is that OS tree is really meant to manage bootable file system trees. So Git is managing just an arbitrary collection of files, whereas OS tree is really designed about bootable file system trees. And the, the, one of the things that uh, is kind of a result of that is you don't really have the concept of branching and merging in OS tree. You're not going to go. You're not going to go work on another branch and then come back and merge it together at the OS tree level. You might do that back at the the source code level that generates the OS tree. But for actual managing of the bootable file system trees in the device, it's pretty much going to be a straight linear history of the device. Sometimes you might have different versions that you put in there that that, that may not be completely linear. But you're you're never going to be merging back and forth uh, within OS tree. And it also manages the bootloader configuration. That's just kind of uh, be because of the fact that it is managing boot bootable file system trees, uh, it, it, all of the configuration needed to select the appropriate bootable file system is, is ha handled through the bootloader configuration as part of the uh, bootloader spec uh, that you see here uh, that's part of the, the free, des free desktop uh, foundation's uh, definition. So, a little bit more detail here. Um, I mentioned the, the content addressable file systems, and you know, so all the files, or as OS Tree calls them, objects, are stored, indexed by their checksum. Like I say, the, the system will take the checksum of the file, and it uses that to generate a file name with a couple of, uh, you know, with some some level of directories, so that you don't have all the files in one directory. And then they are checked out via hard links. So that's the key here. So that when you have a bootable file system tree, each of the files in that tree are hard links to the appropriate objects in the repository. So you have the repository, which contains all of these uh, checksum content addressable files just in, in a directory. And then a, a what they call a hard link farm is generated to reference one specific release. And each of the files in that hard, in that hard link farm are a hard link to the object in the repository itself. By necessity, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the characteristics of an OS tree, bootable file system tree, is that it is immutable. It cannot, it has to be read only. Uh, it has to be managed by OS tree. So you're not going to go in and just modify files directly in one of these file system trees. Um, OS tree does have mechanisms for handling things like configuration files uh, in the Etsy directory, and there's other things that are ignored as part of the, the OS tree managed files. But for any file that is managed directly by OS tree, the only way you will update it is to deploy a new version of your, your bootable file system. Um, 
it does provide a mechanism to commit and check out branches. As I said, you know, the, the, occasionally you'll get branches, but you're never going to get a merge back. Um, the bootloader specification uh, that's uh, available on that free desktop link, uh, it, it basically tells the system how to automatically discover what versions are available on a system, where the kernels are located, where the device trees are located for a specific version, and that kind of thing. It does support both Grub and U-Boot. Uh, for all of the, the systems that we support, uh, it, we use U-Boot uh, uh, on all our ARM-based systems, but it can also support uh, Grub, and there are a number of desktop uh, distros that are using it uh, in that fashion. Um, and it's important to know that it's, it, it is a set of user space tools and that, that, uh, that, that run at the command line. There is not an active runtime that is associated with OS tree. It's all based on the, the hard links and standard file system features. So you don't have an active runtime that's, that's slowing down your system or anything. Uh, it can run on any file system that supports hard links. And because of the way that hard link farm is set up, your, your performance is just the same as if uh, you weren't using OS tree. There's no performance hit to using it, except maybe a little bit of initialization time at boot time when it's processing and, and doing the auto detection of which versions are available and selecting the, the appropriate bootable file system tree. So, the, you know, I, I, this kind of repeats a lot of what I just said. Uh, just a couple more points, though. Uh, normally, the, the, the root of your file system uh, is, is uh, mounted as slash or the root. In an OS tree based system, you actually bind mount slash to somewhere else in the actual file system. It's kind of a it's, it's kind of an inception-based indirection that's a little bit awkward to get your mind around, but uh, normally, uh, once you've started playing with it, it's really not that complicated. And, and uh, to actually be able to do all this processing, it does require an, an, in, an init RAM FS. So the system will boot, launch the init RAM FS. The logic in the init RAM, RAM FS is what does all the uh, manipulation of uh, the bootable file system trees and, and sets up that uh, bind mount for the uh, root file system. So I think this ki this picture kind of helps explain it. So uh, the, the the diagram on the left is the actual raw uh, the, the the raw uh, files that are in the system. So you've got the files under boot, and this is where all the uh, bootloader configuration is stored. And then you have the slash OS tree, and that's what I referred to earlier as the repository. So underneath this rep this OS tree repository, under repo, you have a number of that's where all the objects are stored. So if you look down inside OS tree repo, you'll see directories that are just num uh, the names are just hexadecimal numbers, and then the files are just longer hexadecimal strings that reference that refer to the checksum of each file. And then under the deploy directory, that's where we start getting into these uh, bootable file system trees. So, you know, deploy, and then we've got a, a, a specific OS identifier, and then another deploy directory, and then un underneath there, you will have multiple commits. And each of those commits is essentially the entire bootable file system tree. So the runtime view on the right is essentially looking, this is where that bind mount comes in. So, you know, you've got the files on the left, but uh, the runtime view is that slash is actually looking down at one of the specific commits down inside that OS tree repository. And then, uh, just uh, so, so you're aware, there's also the var directory. Note that in the uh, repository view, var is actually outside of the, the, the uh, commit object. So in this case, var is actually persistent data that's essentially unmanaged by OS tree, so that anything you put in that portion of the directory tree will, will show up and persist across versions and across updates. So for instance, this is where we store our container uh, volumes and configuration and that kind of thing. Uh, anything that we, you know, any user data that's part of the system goes into under var. And then the, um, I will mention, I don't think there's actually a slide on it, but there's also some special handling for Etsy. So you see here, we've got Etsy that's in the managed, uh, managed uh, uh, portion of the repository. But actually what happens is the Etsy is, uh, the, there's a read-only version, and then there's the runtime version, which is read-write. And on any update, the, the system will actually do a three-way merge between the previous version, the new version that you're installing, and, and what's currently on the device. So any changes that your system makes in the field will be maintained via that three-way merge of the slash etc directory. 
And just briefly, some users of this. Uh, I mentioned that there's a number of uh, desktop distros that are using it, uh, Fedora Silverblue and Fedora IoT, uh, notably. Uh, I, I, I've not personally used them. I know some people who have and like them a lot. And uh, then there's a number of others uh, that, 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 uh, that uh, I have not played with. I come from the embedded Linux space, so we're focused mostly on Yocto-based distributions. You've got the uh, meta updater layer. Uh, that can be included in a Yocto configuration to, to provide all the, the classes and configuration needed to uh, add OS tree support to your, to your configuration. And then there's some, some other interesting uses uh, where they actually go up to the package management level uh, where the, you know, things like RPM OS tree and Flatpak, they actually use OS tree under the hood to essentially re-implement the standard RPM view that we have of, of the world today. I, again, I've never played with them. I'm not sure how they work, uh, but uh, the, the intent there is to give you much more uh, atomic, roll, atomic updates and rollback, which has always been an issue when you're dealing with package-based updates. And some alternatives to um, the, 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 something like OS tree, at, at least as far as implementing over-the-air updates, the one that most people have heard of is the uh, dual AB, dual bank, uh, redundant partition setup that a lot of the OTA systems out there use today. Uh, obviously, the downside of that is it takes up additional disk space. Uh, package managers, you know, there are systems you can just do, go in and do an APT update and, you know, APT disk upgrade. Doesn't scale real well because it's, it is hard to manage that atomically. Uh, it's hard to guarantee that uh, the exact same set of packages you tested in your lab is exactly what is on all your devices in the field. Uh, and then there are, you know, you can do some containers. There's um, systemd has some container uh, infrastructure that's part of systemd itself. Uh, again, I'm not terribly familiar with it, so I can't give you the details. But to give you some of the advantages we think of OS tree is uh, the first one is space saving. Uh, the fact that it's got <clears throat> uh, automatic deduplication based on the checksums uh, makes it very space efficient, uh, both in terms of the space on the disk as well as the, the uh, amount of bandwidth you need to download any new update. Uh, OS tree is very uh, capable of figuring out exactly which objects you need and transferring only those files that you don't already have or those files that have changed. Whereas when you're doing a dual AB, um, you might be able to do a binary delta to transfer less data, but you still have to write the entire partition. So OS3 is gonna, gonna save you significant time both in, in uh, download and uh, updating of the flash. Uh, and and uh, another very important thing is that integrity can be, be verified. So the, the, the checksums and, and uh, crypto, uh, cryptographic validation of all these objects is integrated into the system. You know that if you, your system has downloaded completely and the checksums check out, you have exactly what you're expecting to have. You don't have to worry about man-in-the-middle attacks and things like that. That's all integrated and in, in, in part of the system. And uh, yes? I'm sorry? Do you have a way of signing the list of checksums so that you can verify that somebody hasn't altered that? Um, as far as I know, yes. I, could, I, couldn't, I can't tell you uh, all the details of it because that's a, a little bit outside of my scope. I haven't dealt into the, the details of that. But I know, for instance, in, in the Git side of things, uh, let me repeat the question. Uh, I, forgot to, I forgot that. So the question was, uh, when you're dealing with the cryptographic uh, checksums and that kind of things, what kind of guarantees does the system have that, uh, they, can't, that they can't be modified? Um, and it's very similar to the way Git handles things so that you know, if the file is changed, the checksum is gonna change, and then there, there's signatures based on those checksums and that kind of thing. Uh, so they all feed in to, 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 to be able to guarantee, uh, to, to guarantee that uh, the files are unmodified. I, I, I know I didn't really give a, a, a real uh, a thorough answer, but that's essentially it. Um, and, and another thing that we find is very valuable, the last thing on this slide, is the fact that it is immutable. Uh, the system is, is read-only, we know that uh, that, that uh, our devices are running the exact version of all the files that we have tested in our lab. We don't have to worry about package drift where somebody modified something or they installed a package. They either install everything from a new update or they install nothing from a new update. There's no way to, for them to just do a half update and get you know, two packages out of six or whatever. Um, so that, that gives us kind of a, a rudimentary revision control of the uh, of the bootable file system tree on the device, which helps uh, you know helps especially when you're dealing with large numbers of devices. 
So what does power safety mean? Um, the, 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 the issue with a lot of these devices is that they are generally uh, stored in environments that you as a system developer don't have control over. Um, we, our customers range from you know, people uh, putting things in public spaces all the way to very tightly controlled lab environments uh, and, and uh, industrial controls environments. And so you know, the, the, the range of customers we have spans the gamut. Uh, but in general, the idea is you want to think of these devices as uh, they're, they're pretty much out of your control. And so they, they could be attacked at any time by network attackers. Uh, somebody could reach over and grab the, the plug and yank it out of the wall at the wrong time. Uh, and and uh, it might even be very expensive for your team, uh, for your operation staff uh, to access them. They're generally not on site with your team, so it could be very expensive. And the idea is you want to be able to make sure that when you are deploying updates, any of these kind of situations that, that can uh, interrupt the update do not leave you with a brick system. Uh, the simple fact is the cost is just too high. So you want to make sure that the system is either completely installed or not installed at all. No component outside of the update system need, even really needs to be aware that an update is being installed until the update has downloaded and, proper, and been properly uh, propagated through the file system. So a couple things that the OTA system has to do, it has to detect these failures and know uh, when, when they happen and it has to be able to clean up after itself. It has to be able to handle OS changes uh, to that bootable file system tree as a completely atomic operation. And it has to be able to handle automatic rollback. That's also very important, right? I deploy a, a bum update with a, a, a kernel that, that oops is on boot. I don't want to leave the, the, the device sitting there completely waiting. So you want to use watchdogs and things like that and have logic in that init RAM FS that's going to detect that and be able to roll back to that previously known good configuration. So looking at the OS tree update states, so these are the, 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 um, the, the main states uh, greatly simplified uh, of, of an OS tree update. So in left, on the left in blue is you have anything that happens in the context of the old deployment, and then on the right in green is anything that happens in the context of the new deployment. Okay, so when you're getting ready to do an update, obviously the first thing you have to do is fetch, then you assemble the, that, that, uh, that deployment directory that we looked at inside of the repository, and then you do that three-way merge with Etsy that I mentioned, and you'll switch over to the new, uh, the new deployment and run from there. So let's talk about each state individually just so we can kind of understand how uh, OS tree is able to detect failures at any of these states. Um, so fetching, pretty straightforward. Uh, all new objects are fetched over HTTP or HTTPS. Uh, there's compression built in. Any existing objects don't need to be redownloaded. Fairly straightforward stuff, everything you would expect. Checksum is verified. And then the objects at this point are stored raw inside your repository under that OS tree repo objects directory. At this point, they're just objects getting added to the repository. You haven't done any configuration. You haven't actually built up the bootable file system tree yet. And there is an extra feature. You can actually enable a binary delta per file. So depending on what files are in your root file system, you might even be able to get a little bit more savings of download time by using per file deltas. Out of the box, OS tree generally does not enable that. Uh, since it enables downloading only needed objects, you already get quite a bit of savings there. And so the, the, the additional savings for implementing per file binary deltas is, is minimal. So if power failure occurs during this stage, um, the, there's a couple things that happen. Uh, first thing is any of the objects that are downloaded, they are fetched to a staging location first on, uh, that is based on the current boot ID. So each boot, each time the system boots, there's a unique boot ID uh, that, that is generated and the, the objects that are downloaded are going to be indexed based on that. After all the objects have successfully been fetched, if the power, you know, if the power fails during that fetch to a staging location, then this is one of the things we'll see an example of, then it's able to clean that up. Once all the objects uh, uh, have been fetched, then they can be moved from staging and clean up the staging area. So, and then uh, when the system boots, it can inspect the staging area. And if there is uh, something associated with the boot ID that is not the current boot ID, it's able to say that, that there must have been some kind of power interruption and is able to clean up. And then uh, any active deployments that are ongoing from the server at that point will be redownloaded uh, and the, the objects retransmitted. 
So the next step is assembling that deployment directory. So this is where we create the hard links that uh, make up that bootable file system tree. So we're going to create a new deployment directory uh, based on a checksum uh, that, that, uh, that, that, that is created uh, cryptographically tying all the components together. Uh, this is where all the hard links are created uh, for each file, pointing to the, the, the specific object in the repository. And, and the ability to detect failures in this case, uh, it, it basically all comes down to a, a single symbolic link that is created at the very end. And if that symbolic link is, is created, then the, then the update has completed and we're able to switch to it. If that symbolic link does not exist, but uh, some of this deployment directory stuff exists and the system is able to detect that a power failure has occurred. So it's all tied to that atomic creation of that symbolic link at the very end of uh, this, this phase. And then after, after we've created a, f a complete new uh, deployment directory, then we have that three-way merge uh, uh, of the Etsy uh, directory. So the system is able to, to, to look at the unmodified uh, Etsy configuration files from the old deployment, the unmodified Etsy configuration files from the new deployment, and any files that have been modified in the active running system and is able to do that proper three-way merge to make sure that any new changes get pulled in, any changes from uh, you, your devices that, it, that have been made in the field get pulled in, and that all those changes persist properly. Um, similar to the, the previous phase, uh, a, a data origin uh, symlink uh, is used to determine when this phase has completed. So once, this, uh, once, this, once the, the, the three-way merge starts, uh, that file doesn't exist. Once the three-way merge completes, the system is able to create that, that symlink and be able to detect uh, on which side of the, the power failure you were sitting at this point. And so now, once that has completed, we're ready uh, to move into the new system. Uh, so at this point, we're gonna update the, the, the boot configuration. Now we're in the context of the new system, even though we haven't booted yet. We've got everything we need downloaded to the system. We've got everything staged properly so that we can boot into the new system. And so now we're just going to modify the boot environment so that it, it, that it uh, on the next boot, it will select the new version. So a new boot directory in this case will be, config will be uh, created. Uh, with a with an extension for the index, so you know if you for in the case of Horizon, we only keep uh, we only ever have two. We have the current and a new. OS tree supports an arbitrary number, but that that index is essentially which version is it zero or one, and it's just going to ping ping pong back and forth between them. Um, and then, similar to the other phases, there is a sim link created once all of the configuration is updated uh, and that sim link is just OS tree slash boot and that will point at which index we're going to be booting the next time around. So until that, until that sim link has created uh, at the very end of the process, it, the system will, uh, see the, will stay in the old version. If it gets past the point where it has, is able to create that sim link, then when the system reboots, it will be in the new version. And then the next step is the reboot. That's pretty straightforward. And then the, uh, on any boot, uh, and of course the reboot could actually happen anywhere in here. This is only showing the successful reboot, but if the reboot happens at any of, of the other phases, uh, there, there are, the, the system has ways with those sim links and with the boot IDs of detecting where in this, in this process it was and being able to clean up and uh, uh, retransmit as appropriate. So uh, with that, I've got uh, just a few minutes left for demos. Let me just see if I can pull this up here. Uh, yeah, so this is the, the first one. I, I hope you can see it in the back. It's a little bit small. Um, so what I'm running here is I'm actually running a Horizon system with, all, with OS tree in, and all I've got uh, displayed here is the staging directory. So this is just uh, just uh, periodically viewing the the, um, the, the that uh, the, the staging directory that's happening during a download of a new version. So I want to say it takes a while before anything happens. Thank you. So at some point here come in here and we will start to see things showing up in the staging directory. And what I've done in this particular instance is once the staging has started, I just yank the power on the device. And so we see now that um, in the staging directory, we 
our files are based on the boot ID, which is that big long uh, string. I know, I know the, 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 it's kind of small. You can't probably read it in the back, but uh, you can probably tell there's a, a long hexadecimal string there. And that's the, the, the current boot ID. So if we let this run a little bit more, at some point I reboot, so we start to see the reboot here. And then when the system finally gets booted, I log in and we look at the staging and so in a moment we'll see that the, the staging directory has gotten cleaned up. So it knows that uh, the staging was uh, from our previous boot ID or rather from not the current boot ID is all it knows. And so it just uh, deletes it um, and, and we'll start again. So we'll see another staging directory show up here in a minute um, if I didn't cut, cut off the video before that happened. So it cleans everything up. But the, the server side component in this case is still deploying and uh, so I guess I, uh, I, I killed it before it actually got done. So that's the basics for power safety during a download. Now the next one is the, the slightly more complicated one is the power cycle that happens during a deploy and activate phase. So at this point, let me just pause right there. So you can kind of see a number of different things here. Um, you see the, um, the, the, the sim links that I was talking about that, uh, end, that point to loader ending in the dot one, and then you see we have uh, you know, a couple different uh, boot, uh, boot ID based uh, uh, repositories, and we start to see new things starting to get created here. Uh, if I come forward a little bit, Okay, now we're starting to see uh, it, 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 the system is actually has downloaded all the objects and now it's creating that new bootable file system tree. Um, and then we, we also see, now we see that we've got the loader.0, but the loader sim link still points to loader.1, so that means that the system is actually actively setting up the boot configuration. Um, and then I think at some point, yeah, so now we see loader points to loader.0 and the system reboots. So, the, um, and so the system is then able to clean up and, 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 and re, uh, retry the downloads as needed. So with that, I think we have just a few minutes for questions. Let me get to the last slide here because there's a number of uh, re resources and links. Uh, the slides are up on the the conference website. Uh, this last slide, if I can get through all of this, has a, a number of documentation links and things that are that are uh, potentially very useful. So, uh, the, the, a lot of this talk came out of this uh, the 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 next to the bottom link. Uh, the, the a lot more details about this on that blog post. So with that, we've got uh, I guess just five more minutes for questions. Uh, anybody have any questions? Yes. So when moving these new files onto the edge device and then rebooting them to the new deployment, do the old files remain on the device? Or mm -hmm. So yeah. So the question is when you're when you're installing a new update. Uh, what is done to clean up files that are no longer needed, right? So the way that repository works is it's just a bag of bits, right? You've got a bunch of files in there, and you know, for one release, you, you've got one set of files. For another release, you've got another set of files. They're, some of them may be the same. Um, and in general, OS tree won't clean up at that point, right? J any more than Git would clean up an old version unless you explicitly tell it. But there is a mechanism within OS3 to prune old releases. And so with our system, once, the, once we have detected that the new update is installed, all the user installed post install checks have completed, then we will prune out any unneeded versions to help save that disk space. But we obviously keep it around because if we have to roll back, we've got we've to make sure that we've got it. Uh, so that prune only happens once we have completed all the post install and sanity checks. Yes. Um, sometimes I've got OT employers like try to come up with and uh, like a, for example, like a, sometimes. Yeah, so sometimes, sometimes the system requires like a file system upgrades, for example, like from, uh, from, for example, like a, 
uh, FAT32 to NTFS, such kind of stuff. So how do you, like uh, OS3, deal with those things? Uh, simple answer is it doesn't. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, we are, in our system, anything that requires manipulating of the partition table is pretty much unsupported. We do have, uh, we are getting ready to roll out a, a bootloader update feature, um, but uh, that, that uses uh, EMMC boot blocks and a few other things that are part of the hardware. Um, once the, these devices are, are deployed in the field, uh, it, changing anything at the partition level is essentially impossible to do completely safe, safely. So we don't we we don't allow that. That's one. And, and, but I will say that that is one of the benefits of using OS tree versus the dual AB mechanism. Because with the dual uh, partition mechanism, you have to to uh, define the sizes of those partitions. At initial at, at the very beginning of the of the system's lifetime, um, whereas with OS three you have a single partition, so you don't have to worry about the sizes changing. But yes, if you had to do something like you know move from the ext four to zfs for whatever reason, uh, you're going to have to find a, a, an external method to do that because you just can't do it robustly. All right, and I think we've got just another minute or two for questions. Is there a plan for something like DM integrity? For I'm sorry, a sign for what? Is there a plan for something like DM integrity where you have a per runtime check on your data that there's nothing either malicious or unintentionally right. damaged? Yeah, so, so the, and that's a great question and it's something I didn't point out. All these uh, safety mechanisms built into OS tree and the OTA system only protect at update time. Uh, DM Verity is intended to protect at normal boot time, right? It uses ch essentially checksums of the kernel blocks and all the blocks of the root file system. So they're really orthogonal to OS tree. Uh, specifically, are there plans to include it in Horizon? Yes, there are. It's not included today. I don't know all the details, uh, you know, because there's ARM has trust zone and all these other things, and there's a lot of components that will play into that. But that's completely orthogonal to the OS tree mechanism. Yes, so for me as a developer, I'm just interested, for example, to really make a quick update to the file system, for example, deploy a new binary of my own application, right? So I understand the system is read-only, but uh, how does it work in reality for me as a developer? What do I have to do? Yeah, so I mean, as a developer, there are ways you can kind of temporarily remove that read-only and you know just force a binary in. Uh, it will break the ability to then do updates with OS tree later. So that's really just a do it at development time and know that you're going to have to wipe the system uh, later. The alternative would be to store those binaries in a uh, uh, portion of the file system not managed by OS tree. So under the, that var directory, you could just you know SCP a file in, or even just put it under slash Etsy. Um, you know we do have uh, IDE integrations that actually do that. They copy. When you're developing your code, they just copy a whole bunch of files into the user's root directory, which is not actively managed by OS tree, so that uh, you don't have to deal with doing a full OS update every time you want to deploy a new version of your application for testing. OK, thank you. Yep. Anybody else? Very good. Well, thank you so much. And uh, if you have any questions, I'm around all week.